All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today, our webinar or our presentation is When Giving Up Isn't an Option, The Efforts to Stop Little Fire Ants on Maui. Um, Brooke Mankin will be presenting. Brooke is uh, my coworker at the Maui Invasive Species Committee. Um, I worked there six months longer. No. Um, <laughs> he started, he joined MISC in 2004. Uh, he started on the field crews. He was at working at, uh, working in Myconia, doing work on the plant crew. And then when the opportunity arose, he took over the GIS program, working on that. Um, he then left Royal and came back, as many wise people do, um, and took over the Little Fire Ant program once, when we started to have problems with Little Fire Ants as well. So he's got a wide ranging field experience, which has given him a unique perspective on GIS management and, you know, has really shaped his career. Um, he's very attentive to detail um, and very creative and inventive, um, including uh, he's also an award-winning mustache. Yes. Uh, yes. Hard to see with the beard there, but it's Yeah. Real. And an inventor of many kinds. So it's including the, I forgot, what was the mustache inventor? The Merler. The mustache. The Merler. Had a patent pending on that. Yeah. So, so many talent, multi-talented, but lucky for us, he is working with MISC and he's brought many of his talents here. Um, and I think that his his perspective, his dedication to detail and his creative approach to figuring out how to get rid of little fire ants in an area where we thought it was going to be impossible um, is greatly appreciated. I don't know too many other people that could have done that. So I'll let you go ahead and tell everybody how you did it. Sure. So go ahead. Um, hold on a second here. I'm going to share this presentation and what do you guys see? Hold on a second. Looks good. Now nope. it doesn't. Yep. Okay. How about that? Do you see good. that? Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, uh, just fair warning. Um, if you have, um, if you're a longtime follower of my presentations and um, you've seen me talk before, um, there's going to be a lot of the same stuff in here. Um, this is the same old song and dance as some um, recent uh, presentations given uh, in the last six months or so. Um, but uh, here we go. Let's just get into it. Advance. Okay. Little fire ants. I know that several of you um, I know personally that I could see have joined from the chat. You know what little fire ants are, but I don't know all of you. So we're going to go through this. What are little fire ants? They are tiny, tiny, little, itty bitty, stinging ants. Um, here is a picture of them with a queen. The queens are considerably larger. That's a typical thing for ant species. Um, little fire ants go by many common names. In Hawaii, we call them little fire ants. And um, for example, in Australia, they're known as electric ants. They are considered one of the world's worst invaders. They are arboreal. That means they live in trees as well as on the ground. They form super colonies in a lot of conditions. Um, ants of the same species may have two separate colonies and each has a queen. When they come across each other, they would do battle with each other. In the case of uh, species that form super colonies, they often have multiple queens all throughout the landscape and um, they all get along together. And so that enables them to create this one massive sprawling infestation. Um, they, they sting, they are devastating to the environment and agriculture, quality of life, and a whole list of things. So um, this is what little fire ant stings might look like. Uh, a lot of times they are so small, little fire ants are about as long as a nickel is thick. They are tiny, tiny little ants. Um, I know that's, that's a relative term when you're talking about ants. Ants are small, but there are big ants and there's little ants, and then there's tiny, tiny ants, and these are very small ants. Uh, if they were on your feet and you were standing up, you might not be able to see that there were ants on your feet, right? Oftentimes when people get stung by these, they don't know what's stinging them. Um, they, I've had people report, oh yeah, every time I go under this tree, I get a rash. 
they thought they were allergic to the tree, but it was actually little fire ants raining down on them and stinging them. Um, this is a, some families that decided to go on a picnic in an infested area and um, look at them. They're having a, a terrible time. They will sting um, not people, but pets, animals, all sorts of things. Um, when they sting animals in the eye repeatedly, it causes uh, clouding and eventual blindness. And so oftentimes pets are um, co going to their food, which little fire ants are attracted to and are all over the dog food or cat food that's outside. And the animal goes to take a bite and gets ants all over them and they get stung on the eyes. They will sting, um, you know, not just pets, but uh, wild animals. Um, I have been told that the veterinarian um, on the big island where little fire ant infestation is rather out of control, um, that most of the animals coming into the veterinarian office have cloudy eyes because they're being stung by little fire ants. Um, and they, they sting even the cutest of animals and pets, even that little baby deer that's inside watching TV or whatever it's doing. They also uh, rant pest insects, so aphids and scale and things like that. Um, a lot of these types of uh, insects have evolved with ant species. And so like, for example, aphids, they actually have a um, sugary secretion that the ants can consume. And so they will protect aphids, they will move them around and increase their abundance. So um, they make pests worse. And when they do that, when they're ranching them, they, they wear a little cowboy hat. And um, so little fire ants are all around totally devastating to the Hawaiian ecosystem. They wipe out most animals that um, dare to live in the, within their super colony. Uh, actually, the Death Star operator was a little fire ant. Most people don't know that. And um, they also banded together with Sauron. Um, you know, in Mordor, that that was not good. They did lose that one, and they were they were actually seen it January sixth. If you can believe that. Um, so they they originated in South America. In this map, you can see the green area is their native range, and um, they spread out across the world. Um, they came to Hawaii from Florida. Thanks, Ron DeSantis. Um, and in Hawaii, they first were detected on the, the Big Island in 1999. Um, it was, they were also detected on Kauai in 1999. Uh, very different outcomes for those islands. And uh, not discovered on Maui until 2009 and uh, Oahu 2013. Uh, Lanai also, they were discovered in 2014, very, um, that was stopped quickly at a uh, nursery that they were vigilantly watching and, uh, and they were never seen again. So um, we're going to talk about Maui, of course. Um, like I said, they were first discovered on the Big Island in 1999. And my understanding is that they were in perhaps a municipal green waste and um, that green waste was um, shared about and little fire ants uh, had gotten out of control uh, shortly after they were detected. And this is uh, actual footage of the Big Island being consumed by little fire ants here. They then um, got on a boat and uh, Big Island shared their little fire ants with Maui in 2009. And since then, uh, this graph Sorry, is not up to date, but the actual number is there are 21 infestations or incursions. Um, not all are equal. Some um, are naturalized infestations and some are uh, little fire ants. Made it here on this um, shipment of hapu'u ferns and was quickly taken care of and never seen again. But um, there are 21 as of yesterday. Um, before yesterday, there were 20 in, uh, incursions of little fire ants known on Maui. Um, that's where we come in, the fire ant removal team. And um, here we are defending Maui. 
That's my right hand man, Monty, uh, shooting at that giant little fire ant there. And uh, so, so what do we do? We we go out and we have to. First thing we have to do is survey and find where the infestation is. Usually, uh, we get a, a call or report from the public. Um, somebody says I've been stung by ants, and they either provide a sample to us or we go out and we survey for them. And um, little fire ants, uh, they really like peanut butter, and so we use peanut butter in a little plastic vial. We place it out there in the environment in a nice shady spot and we leave it there for about an hour and we come back and pick that up. We take a GPS point and um, we take that sample back to the lab where Monty then um, looks under a microscope to identify them because they are so small you cannot tell them apart from other little orange ants which we do have in Hawaii um, without a microscope. Once he's identified them, he can mark that record as having little fire ants, and then I can make a map and we can um, see how large the infestation is and where we need to do our work to get rid of them. Um, we try to place samples out every 15 feet or five meters. Uh, more closely together would be better, but um, five meters is theoretically the um, area that uh, little fire ants might forage away from a nest. Um, this is this is based on expert opinion, and um, in many situations varies. You know, so what does that look like? If you um, had a little fire ant nest there in yellow, um, that would be maybe the area that ants from that nest travel to forage. Um, or if you dropped a sample at that yellow point, that would be perhaps the area that you were. Um, surveying from from that point. Um, so if that was a, a little, the yellow dot was a sample and the blue dots were nests, for example, um, we might be detecting those nests that fall within that radius. And each one of those nests have it may have its own foraging area in blue here, right? So when we calculate what the area is infested, we use this 10 meters, we go, we buffer out 10 meters, and that should encompass um, the possible areas that uh, little fire ants may be detected from that single sample. These are just some of the metrics that we use to do the work. And when we create an area to be treated for our treatment zone, we go out 20 meters from each uh, positively identified sample that we collect, and that would then um, we take all of that area and that would become our treatment zone. Uh, the reason it goes out so far beyond what the area that's infested is because these methods are imperfect and we may not detect uh, ants outside that are actually there. And so um, that is a conservative approach to uh, cover all of the area that we think the little fire ants might be in. Um, once we've created those treatment zones, we can then break it up into uh, a, a grid to help uh, guide the work. So if we were to say place a sample within each one of those squares, we might get a um, coverage that we like. This is a larger than what we normally use. We usually use a grid that's smaller, um, like a five meter grid like this, um, which would help us to get the, the actual coverage that is adequate for um, to have confidence in our survey. Um, then, then we need to go about treating. There are a lot of tools that we use to treat. We have toxic baits and we have insect growth regulators. Insect growth regulators are a birth control. Um, the one that we use is uh, S-methoprene and it's mixed into, you can see that uh, bucket, um, into a, a gel bait, which is vegetable oil, water, xanthan gum, which is a thickening agent, peanut butter or beef liver powder, and then our active ingredient, the, um, methoprene. And so that uh, was developed by the Hawaii Ant Lab. And um, it's important because little fire ants, I stated earlier, they're arboreal, so they live in trees. And we need to be able to get our bait up into trees. There could be ant nests or colonies up high enough that get everything they need and don't need to come to the ground. So if we were just using a granular bait, which is um, what a lot of the off-the-shelf uh, products are, those ants would never get to it. 
And so um, the gel bait is really important and we use that all the time in our work. Um, the birth control, just like human birth control, it wears off if they quit eating it. So it does not kill the ants. Um, if we regularly feed it to them, we, we do treatments every six weeks, then the queens can no longer reproduce and the ant colonies will then die of old age and eventually collapse. What's really nice about the insect growth regulator is it has very low impact on the ecosystem and um, it, it can be used on crops, for example. It's one of the only things that we can use on crops. We have to avoid them um, depending on what other toxic substance we might be using. The um, ideal situation is um, use them both together. And uh, this is just a little slide I threw in that um, shows the relative toxicities of some common things and then some of our baits that we use. Um, we take those mapped those treatment areas and we put them onto a GPS uh, enabled tablet or phone. And um, then in the field, we have real time guidance to ensure that we are being comprehensive in the work that we do. This doesn't work. Uh, invasive species control in general does not work if you are not thorough, detail oriented and comprehensive in your effort. So um, it's very important to be able to have these guidance products in front of you as you do the work. Otherwise, you will make mistakes and you will miss things. Um, the way the treatments work with the toxic bait and the birth control, for example, um, this was an, this methodology also developed by Hawaii Ant Lab, um, is that for the first, uh, when you discover a colony and you begin treatment, you do one year of treatments. And the first six months, use the insect growth regulator. And so that's the birth control. You actually won't see any changes to the population until about four months until um, several treatments. And um, that's because the, the ants are still alive. They just do not begin to die until about three months, three to four months, the workers, queens can live longer. However, if they have no workers to tend to them, they um, will probably die soon thereafter. So you can use the insect growth regulator to do treatments for an entire um, an entire treatment cycle of a whole site. Um, but what is ideal is to switch at six months to a toxic bait. Um, and it is the one, two punch. And so the ants are unable to reproduce and then you throw in a toxic bait and, um, the, the whole thing collapses. That's the, the idea behind that. At the end, we do this massive survey and, uh, if any ants are detected at that point, we redraw our treatment zone just around where those ants are and we continue treatments again for another three treatments. And we go in and we survey that area. If there are none there, we continue the survey in the whole area. If we find ants again, we redraw the treatment zone, et cetera, et cetera. I have a little um, demonstration here to show you what that looks like. So this is a real site on Maui. Um, the blue dots represent locations where we surveyed and did not find little fire ants. The red dots are where we did find little fire ants. So um, this happens to be uh, in a residential community on the beach. And um, if we take away those blue dots and we focus on just the red dots, that would be the area that we considered infested. Um, of course, we, you know, we can't serve, we're not surveying inside of these mansions and or in the water at the beach so we're limited by certain things but um if we buffer at 20 meters that would create our treatment zone so um this is what the treatment zone would look like and we put that onto our gps go back out and then we begin treatment and so um, this example actually illustrates what happens when you do the treatment without that guidance because this first treatment was done before we had the real-time GPS um, available to us. And so you can see parts parts of the infested area were clearly missed. Um, however, we got that up and running by the time the second treatment came around. And um, this is a more thorough coverage. There's gaps where the houses are um, and roads and things. And so this is 
treatment after treatment. Um, treatment four here. Sorry. And then um, it came time, we often do a mid treatment survey to just check on things, how they're going. And um, you can see already there is a large change, a significant change in the population. There are still little fire ants detected. Um, so we continue our treatments on till the end of the year. And then um, this is this is when we do a very tight survey. And you can see I'm using hexagons instead of squares. Hexagons are the best of guns. They are better in many ways than a square grid. Don't get me started on tessellation, but this is the survey results. And we did find little fire ants in two locations. So what we do is we redraw the treatment zone and now treatments are a lot easier and cheaper to conduct. We go back in, we continue doing several treatments and go back and do another big survey. The surveys are a lot of effort. Um, it's a lot easier to do a treatment than it is to do a survey. The surveys may take several days, several crew members, um, many days to do, to complete. Whereas uh, treatments are usually um, easy to get done in a site this size, which is somewhere around six, seven, eight acres, I think. Um, in a day, right? So we found little fire ants again, not in the places that we had continued treating. So we again, redraw the treatment zone and go back at it. This is how a lot of sites end up looking and it may take several years of doing this to finally eradicate one of the sites. Just to Maui, this is what, um, this is an overview of the infestations on Maui. And again, sorry, this presentation isn't entirely up to date. Um, there are a uh, few changes in here, but including um, two new locations on Maui. Um, one of them was a, a minor incursion and appears to be one and done. Um, somebody received a shipment from the big island of plant starts and they opened them up and got stung by ants, knew immediately to call us. They actually collected samples and treated themselves with Amdro, granular ant bait. And we went up and surveyed the area thoroughly and did not find any little fire ants. And I think that that was it for that site. So that's a good one. Um, then the other one, uh, new one as of yesterday is in the clustered area of um, red dots in on the North shore there and is associated with one of those sites that um, went undetected for some time, even though we had looked in that same location many times. Um, there's different color here. Um, the green dots are eradicated. That means there's been over five years since any ants were found at those locations. And so we consider that eradicated and we no longer do any work at those sites. Um, the blue sites are places that are in monitoring meaning that we have gotten rid of the ants in those locations and we continue to go back to survey and we will do that for five years. And if if we go for five years without finding a little fire ants, we call it eradicated and it will become a green dot. And then the red dots are the active sites, the sites that are um, actively being treated. And um, nearly all of those are greatly reduced in size. Um, and they are in that sort of hotspot phase where we chase around locations and survey and it's changed again and we continue the treatment. And so um, what I'm telling you is that all known locations of little fire ants on Maui are um, in uh, active management. Um, there are no uh, sites that are like not being attended to by the Maui Invasive Species Committee with help from the Department of Ag. Uh, the, also, the other thing is that these dots are um, a couple of different sizes. There's three different sizes of dots here and they represent the um, rough size of the infestation. One of these dots is very large compared to the others, the blue dot on the east side of Maui, which I will talk about um, soon. So these of those um, 
that um, are not uh, eradicated or the ones that are that were naturalized and established and took years to work on, you can see um, they range from around one, two acres to um, eight or nine acres actually that we've got. Um, some of them have expanded over time. They've kind of, uh, one side has shifted out a little bit while we wiped it out. But uh, what we're doing is we're taking the overall footprint to, um, for these calculations. One of these sites is not like the others, and it is 175 acres. Um, this is the uh, number of sites that have been in management over time uh, by quarter, and so and by their uh, their phase. And so you, you can see um, that since I've included the eradicated sites in there in green, that this this graph will only grow but hopefully it will become all green. Um, this is a similar graph, but this is the acres that have been in management over time with the exclusion of the one very large site in Hiku. And what you can see here is the blue is growing. So those are the sites that we are monitoring and um, not finding ants. And so that is good. The red is still small, the areas that are in active treatment, where there are ants that we're finding, there, where there's um, actual infestations is a small number. That's good. So here we go. This 175 acre site, much larger than any other site on Maui. And that is uh, in Hiku on the east side of Maui. Um, hopefully this little animation works. Here we go. Uh, that is roughly what the site looks like. You can see it's linear going all the way down to the ocean um, and centered around a drainage. This is what the site looks like. Um, this is what the site used to look like when we first discovered it. Um, what we think happened, um, well, first of all, uh, just to characterize this a little bit, there are massive swaths of how bush. And if you're not familiar with how, it is a um, very dense vegetation that um, grows upon itself. It's like a, a jungle gym. And oftentimes to get around or work in how, you need to crawl under it or climb over it, but you can't go through it unless you have a chainsaw. And even then it is, um, it, since it grows upon itself and under pressure, it's very dangerous to cut because you can cut a limb that is under tension and it can come back and uh, just completely knock your block off. So that um, how Bush made it difficult in areas at this site uh, we think it was probably introduced Malka. So this is about a mile long and uh, the top elevation is nearly a thousand feet. And um, there is a stream that runs all the way down to the ocean. And what we think happened is the ants introduced at the Malka elevation site washed down the stream and um, created this very linear infestation. So oh, um, let me go back here. When we found this in 2014, this was unlike any other site on Maui. And um, it was quickly realized that our traditional ground methods would not be adequate. And we needed to do something different. And um, we thought that uh, using a helicopter was uh, our best bet. So to, to do that, there was quite a bit of work that had to be done. Uh, one, we had to get special permitting to be able to use that very same insect growth regulator. Um, but we knew that we couldn't avoid applying it directly to the water um, in that stream. And so we had to get a special permit to be allowed to do that. Um, the product that we used actually um, is used 
to be put in water and places all over the East Coast, like in Florida, they use it for mosquito control. They apply it directly to bodies of water. Um, in our case, we had to use it off label to mix it into a gel bait to feed to ants. And so um, that was some of the permitting that we went through. Um, we had uh, Fish and Wildlife Service came out and surveyed for uh, threatened and endangered species. There is a damselfly, uh, native Hawaiian damselfly known from that area. The results of that, we looked in the streams. All the streams were chock full of mosquito fish. The native damselfly evolved in the absence of stream predators. And so when your streams contain mosquito fish, it's almost mutually exclusive that there will not be um, the native damselfly in that area. So it was determined it uh, was not around. And then we also had to figure out how we were going to apply this gel bait from a helicopter. Um, the, the traditional uh, aerial application systems are for applying watery substances like herbicides or fertilizers and not a gel bait. The gel bait is this viscous pancake batter like substance it does not flow through your pump and spray nozzle the same way that liquid would. So we had to come up with a way to deliver that bait. So, um, Maui Invasive Species Committee has quite a bit of experience using helicopters and using um, belly-mounted spray tanks with a long line and a distal spray ball at the end of that line that um, was used for treating plants um, with herbicides. And so what we did is we took that system and we adapted it to use for our gel bait. And instead of it spraying straight down onto a plant, we needed to, to spray as far wide as we could to create a large swath so that we could do fewer passes across the area to um, evenly distribute our gel bait throughout the infested area. We also had to change the pumps out and come up with some um, creative solutions for um, getting that bait to flow through the system in a way that, um, that worked. So when we did that, we um, we calculated the the swath uh, to be about 22 meters in diameter, and um, once we had that up and running, we were ready to go and begin treatment. So we created a treatment zone uh, that we wanted to target, and that's the area in black. And this is what we knew about the infested area when we started. Um, there was an abundance of little fire ants. And we began flying. And uh, that looks what that looks like is um, there's a spotter sitting next to the pilot holding a um, tablet with GPS to help guide the pilot. And um, when the pilot starts spraying, they press a button, the spray is started. And when they stop, they press another button, the spray is stopped. And so this is what the raw data would look like. And um, we, we can then determine um, the areas that were being sprayed and were not. So um, the not areas would be tails and we have to go about removing those. And um, then we have our, our data of the area sprayed and, and we were um, starting in 2019, October of 2019 was the first treatment. And we did 13 treatments over 19 months. And this is what all of those um, tracks look like uh, piled up on top of each other. Um, this is what they look like if they were spaghetti and the how with meatballs. That's that's for you, Willie. Um, and if you take and you buffer the tracks um, out to be 22 meters wide, this is what the area covered would look like um, piled up on top of each other. And if you then take all of that data, you can add it all up and create a heat map. And this heat map here shows in black areas that were treated 13 times and in white areas that were treated only once and that whole gradient in between. And so you can see that we got um, some really good coverage here. 
And so I'm just going to overlay that old data on top of this. This is what we knew going into it. And um, the area of focus is just inside their treatment zone. I get rid of all those um, extraneous points outside. And um, this is just a little information about how many samples inside this treatment zone contained little fire ants. And um, this is, uh, I should say, this is composite data. It took years to, to get acquire all of this data, but there were um, 15, over 1,500 samples um, containing little fire ants in our treatment zone out of, um, you can see almost uh, 6,000 others that, that didn't have them. So at this point, um, like I said, that took years to obtain that data. And now we needed to go back and see how the survey or the treatments had worked and do one comprehensive survey of the area as quickly as we could. And so that had never been um, embarked upon before. And so we got uh, all of our MISC staff together, um, our various crews. We have a little fire ant crew. We have a myconia crew. We have a plant crew. We've got a coke crew. And we brought them all together to do this major survey. We had like over 25 people participate, um, spent four weeks camping out there. Um, and although we'd like to do a five meter survey, that just was not um, feasible. So we did a little bit looser of a survey. Um, there was the, the, the grids you can see in the bottom of this are 14 meters instead of five meters. And what did we find? Um, well, this is what the survey looked like. I forgot about this slide. Uh, when we go out here in this rugged terrain, there are pigs and mongoose that are eating and stealing our vials. We're climbing under how through sticker bushes. There's cattle. Um, there's like hidden pitfalls and aluhe and uh, overhead grass and mud and mosquitoes and it is no walk in the park. And um, as you can see, this is exactly what it uh, felt like when we were out there. Um, and so the results of that survey was very heartening. We did find little fire ants. Um, they seem to be all kind of in one location, more or less uh, down near the ocean. But um, the majority of our samples came back without little fire ants. And um, I was really skeptical going into this. And uh, I couldn't believe my eyes that, that it had worked as well as it did. Um, you can see that some of our samples, where we, the bulk of the red points that you see where little fire ants were discovered, were actually just outside of our treatment zone, um, inside of the area that we aim to treat were far fewer um, little fire ants. Uh, and so here's a similar graph. You can see that um, the little fire ants present was a very small number. Um, over 99% of our samples came back without little fire ants. Um, so uh, even though ants were found outside of our treatment zone, um, that doesn't mean we don't need to go get them. Um, so if you zoom in and look, you can see uh, that although there were a few treatments in that area, there were not nearly um, enough to treat the, that pocket that um, we weren't aware of when we began the treatments. Um, so another thing that we collect when we're out there is uh, we do note the presence or absence of ants at all. Um, and so the orange dots I've now put up are locations that we found other ant species. There's over 60 species of ants in Hawaii. And um, typically in a little fire ant infestation, if you go to the center of that infestation, you won't find any other ants besides little fire ants because they push everything out um, or kill and destroy other ant species within their infested area. And so um, what you can see here is there there were other ant species um, in, in the area. Sorry. 
Um, what you'll note, um, kind of in the center of the screen, there is um, a survey that goes outside of our treatment zone. And then over to the right near the ocean, there are some surveys outside of our treatment zone. And what you can see is that there's a lot of ants outside of our treatment zone. Um, and what it works out to be is about every other sample um, in this area contains other ant species, except for when you get into our treatment zone. So what I did here is I, I, um, I took all of these points and I overlaid them on the heat map. And I was able to extract from the heat map how many treatments that specific location got. And um, that's what this looks like in a graph. So on the left-hand side are locations that got zero treatments. And every other sample, 50% of the samples contain ant species, right? Whether they're little fire ants or not. Um, and then as the number of treatments increase, you find less and less ants in those areas. Why am I showing you this? Because this shows us that our treatment is working and not just a failure of the survey method, for example, which is something I considered when we were not finding ants. I was like, what are we doing wrong? Well, we weren't doing anything wrong. We had treated everything and there were no ants to find or very few of them to find in our treatment zone. So right here, I've highlighted three different groups and just to simplify what that graph looks like, you can think of it this way. Um, you know, 50% of a samples come back in a place where there's been no treat treatments with ants in them and um, less and even less with uh, more, more treatments as you go. So um, there's a lot of details about ants. Um, we, we weren't done, right? We advanced and we had to redraw our treatment zone. Um, there's no sense to treat all the rest of that area. Um, so what we did is we drew a treatment zone around where the ants were and the areas that we were unable to adequately sample, those areas of dense how. And so we decided if we're going to be in the air in the area, we might as well continue treating those places just in case because we weren't able to sample them. And so we continued on with the new treatment zone. Um, we did uh, seven treatments over eight and a half months. And at that time, it was time to go again and do the massive Nihiku survey. And we did it again. And this time, we got even better covers than we did last time. And we found less ants, but there were still some ants there. We also found non-LFA ants. And um, you can see they actually seem to be coming back in abundance. This is exactly what we would expect, is that after we've gotten rid of the little fire ants and stopped our treatments, that all of the ants outside of the treatment zone would begin to come in and repopulate those areas. So we zoom in and take a look. The ants that we found, um, for the most part, were in very low quantities. So we actually count the number of ants that we collect in the vials. If you place a um, little peanut butter vial in the middle of a healthy little fire ant infestation, you might get anywhere between 400 to 600 ants in that sample. When you go and you place a sample in a treated infestation where the ants are dying and there are very few left, you get very low numbers, um, low dense densities. And uh, that's exactly what we saw. We, um, I mean, we literally could only detect what what is this like 30 40 little fire ants um, in in all those samples you know we placed uh, just about 5,000 samples this year um, the year that I'm talking about and and we only found about 40 little fire ants total um, and so that's like 0.1 percent of the samples we placed out contains little fire ants. But things are continuing to look good. We weren't done yet. Um, we didn't change, need to change the treatment zone. And so we continued on. We did another four treatments over four months. And at this time we went back and we sampled 
the areas that we were um, concerned about. And at that time, the one location no longer had little fire ants. And we found a single sample containing three little fire ants at the one location uh, that is down by the ocean. What we felt at that time was that the ants, this was the death rows, um, the ants were on their way out and that we didn't really need to continue our treatment. So we came back a little bit later, surveyed again, and we could not find any little fire ants. Um, so uh, we were really happy about that. And um, at that point, it was time to do another survey. And this survey is 2023. So this was last October. Was the first time we did a whole site survey and we found zero little fire ants. Okay, so just laughing for myself since I can't see what you guys are doing. I'm just screaming into the void here. I don't even know if you're still with me anymore. What, how many people? Oh, there's 11 participants. Got an extra one. Okay, so that was great news. And as we expected, other ant species are starting to fill back in the area. So the presence of other ants, let me just reiterate, is, is a good sign because that means that there's likely not little fire ants because when there's little fire ants around, there's not other ants around. So the places that we stop treating, you can see clearly um, ants are beginning to repopulate. So things are um, going just as expected. So currently in this very large, Maui's largest infestation, we are unable to detect little fire ants. Um, if we do find them again, which we need to continue monitoring, um, we expect that it will be a small localized area and it may be that we do not need a helicopter to continue that treatment. The treatments can then transition to ground treatments. It will depend on what the canopy above looks like. There are some very large eucalyptus trees in the area that um, with our backpack sprayers, our ground treatments, we are un unable to get uh, the gel bait up high enough into those um, trees to be effective. Um, now for a little bit of context, uh, this is the only large area landscape level uh, eradication, if they are eradicated, that has uh, occurred in Hawaii um, and around the world. Um, there are a lot of efforts on multiple ant species, um, including little fire ants to eradicate and there is, um, there's a lot of it is unpublished, but there is a paper by Ben Hoffman about um, that tries to uh, summarize many of the efforts worldwide. A lot of those are in Australia. Um, so there's a review of 316 efforts and um, in several different species, including little fire ants, but um, of the aerial treatments, there were. Um, unsuccessful outcomes and successful outcomes, but all of these aerial treatments that happened elsewhere in the world were granular treatments. So what we've done is using this gel bait and um, creating this system is totally novel. Nobody else has done this anywhere. And um, as far as I understand, uh, there have not been aerial treatments attempted on little fire ants. And so, um, not only is this the only landscape level eradication in the state of Hawaii, it is the first of its kind in the world. It's a world first um, eradication from using a helicopter on little fire ants, Wasmania Aro Punctata. So um, we are very pleased about the results of this effort. Um, and then just briefly here in uh, the rest of Hawaii, um, the situation is not going so well for all of the islands. On um, Kauai, 
They have five active sites. Um, they've got an eradication under their belt and they've got one monitoring. But um, my understanding is that uh, some of these sites are not completely mapped and several of these sites are not being uh, treated or um, completely treated. Um, on Oahu, things are looking a little bit worse. They've got 33 active sites um, as of the time I got this, this map. And um, there are uh, a lot of efforts by the community to do something. And um, hopefully there's more funding headed towards Hawaii Ant Lab and Oahu Invasive Species Committee and the Department of Ag over there to do something. But um, sadly, this likely means that on Maui, we are going to be under even more pressure, not just from shipments that are possibly invested coming from the Big Island, but also now coming from Oahu. And um, I won't even speculate on how this um, is going to affect the quality of life and economy on Oahu, um, but it is um, sorely needed is resources on Oahu to go in to their effort. Um, Maui is extremely lucky as we have been um, well supported by our county and the state to do the work that we do. Um, we, we get quite a bit of funding from um, County of Maui to do the little fire ant work um, when compared to Oahu, Kauai, and the Big Island combined. And so um, just last thing, um, this the effort in Hiku, the aerial eradication, um, demonstrates that with the proper resources, these landscape level eradications are possible. And um, not everybody believes that. Um, and if you don't, you should come to my talk next time or watch this on YouTube. But um, we we cannot give up on this. I cannot stress how much, how life altering little fire ants are. I have a friend um, on the Big Island who told me recently that um, it's bad getting worse and that kids don't play outside in the Hilo area because they don't want to get stung by little fire ants. I mean, what is Hawaii if we can't be outside? I, I'm not going to proselytize here, but um, it is not the time to give up. Every dollar spent living without little fire ants, even if it's for a little bit of time, is money well spent. And... Uh, with that, you know, thank you to Hawaii Ant Lab, Department of Ag, um, Hawaii Invasive Species Council, County of Maui, and our crews that have worked so hard on this project um, over the years. And um, that's it. That's, that's all I'm going to talk about. All right. Thank you, Brooke. Um, so there's a couple of questions. If you had anything, you want to put it in the Q&A. Um, there was a request of, can you and do you do awareness presentations in different communities? Do you want to answer that, Lisa? <laughs> um, yes, we do presentations. Uh, we can book, I'll, I'll book Brooke to go do a presentation anywhere. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, I mean, I ideally, if you've got a group already gathered, that's easiest, but yeah, pretty much anywhere, Maui County, we're happy to come give a presentation. We also have done several um, community meetings when there are new infestations in a neighborhood, for example. Um, it's really useful to get everybody there aware and in one room so they can point fingers at each other about who brought the infested material. No, just kidding. Don't do that. But we do um, explain what we're doing to those communities. And um, it's really helpful to have public awareness because, like I said in the beginning, Nearly all of our infestations were discovered because somebody reported stinging ants. And so we just can't be everywhere. And even when we try to be, we don't find infestations. It's really important for community awareness. So thank you for that question. 
Yeah, word of mouth is super critical. We um, Every year in the fall, we do a uh, Little Fire Ant Awareness Month, spot the ant and stop the ant. And so we try to uh, encourage people to test their yards. You should test your yard anyway, um, annually. And so this is just kind of an annual reminder, but again, just, you know, word of mouth is our greatest outreach tool. So telling your friends and neighbors and helping build public awareness is critical. Um, trying to think, is there any, I don't see any other, let me see, there's one more question here. Yeah, Beth was asking about H two A money. Um, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but I know that OISC um, is going to have quite a bit of funding for little fire ant work on Oahu, and it's through a federal grant. Um, I can't remember the name of the grant or how much money it is, but um, I hope that it is impactful. Um, was there ever a point, because I think that there's, you know, sort of the challenges on um, where you were just like, all right, we can't do this. This is too big. Oh, yeah. I mean, when when we were developing the aerial system and, you know, like we, we didn't even know exactly where the boundary of that infestation was. We just kind of drew a that an area that seemed to be around it and you know like i i wasn't sure i wasn't sure i was i was confident and i wasn't gonna give up but i wasn't sure that was gonna work and um, when we went in and we did our surveys and and the first two days we came back with almost zero ants i was wringing my hands i was like oh we're doing it wrong what what's going wrong you know th these guys aren't sampling correctly and and then it occurred to me, no, this is exactly what we expect to see if it's working. And it was working. And it's just I'm I'm still um humbled that that whole effort went as well as it did. Yeah, it's pretty crazy to see the terrain and the vegetation and um gotta say, I uh yeah, quite impressed to see that it happened. I don't know that any of us thought for sure that this is a win, but it was the best attempt. Yep. Looks like in the um, attendee list that Mr. Chris Candido did make it. You're late, Chris. <laughs> awesome. Just like always. Former MISC employees. All over the country. Uh-huh. Okay, well, that concludes our talk, but please stay for just one minute. Um, we'll let everybody get back to their work days and their other days and everything else. Um, and we'll go ahead and do close with the, the final poll at the end, but be sure to um, check out any of the other high SAM presentations that are will be happening through the rest of the month. If you're on Maui too, we've got a live event um, on March 30th. Uh, it's only two question poll. Um, and there is going to be another talk about our new development, our greatest and latest tool in the efforts to detect little fire ants. Um, it will be this Thursday at three o'clock. Um, and it'll be about conservation dogs because we just got a dog dedicated to finding little fire ants. So yep. still going through some training programs, but it's going to be a new tool. So very, really excited about that. So you can tune into that. All right. Thanks, Heather. Good to see you. Thanks, Heather. Did you learn anything new, Heather? Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Okay. I think that concludes it. So, mahalo.